Okay, I'm actually going to try and keep this presentation short. I realize that's sort of against the rules of the game today, but. <laughs> uh, and it's on the question of Renaissance in music. And I think the question that we're really posed with is, is it possible for us to create a renaissance out of this very deep, dark age that we're in? And I can tell you absolutely yes. And the reason I know that is because it's been done in China in the last 40 years, which is what I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of. Now, if people want to know more, this movie, From Mao to Mozart, is excellent. It's available to be rented at it's expensive to buy, but you can rent it from Netflix DVD. And it's about the trip that Isaac Stern, the violinist, and his family took to China in 1979, just as they were coming out of the Cultural Revolution. And it's quite extraordinary. But to begin by giving you a sense of the difference between our cultures right now, I want to quote a guy who's the head of something called IMG Artists, which is a artist, uh, you know, uh, an artist management service. And he says, Chinese teenagers receive classical music with an ardor similar to what American teenagers have from pop music. If you say to a 16-year-old kid, do you want to see Lady Gaga? Or do you want to see classical pianist Conrad Tapp? The Americans will all say Lady Gaga. But for the Chinese, it's exactly the opposite. Good for them. Now, this isn't a genetic difference. <laughs> um, both of these realities exist because of conscious decisions that have been made on the part of leadership groupings in the United States and in China. And to have a sense of that, you have to go back around 50 years ago. Actually, about the time that Joel was talking about it, in terms of the space program. Um, you had a move to create a dark age both in China, people are familiar with the Cultural Revolution, but also in the United States. And to actually drive people into a kind of culture, especially the youth, that turned them into beasts. Now, if you look, 1964, in the United States, we had what was known as the British Invasion. And now you can't show the trying pictures. Uh, oh, there are some of the invaders. Uh, you had, uh, this was shortly after the assassination of John Kennedy, and you had a move to bring in the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, this whole degenerate culture which said, you know, you don't want music that affects your head, you want music that affects you below the belt. <coughs> and that's what was provided, and turned American youth into a degenerate grouping, and, uh, in 1966, most of, many of us here were part of the youth, uh, that was used against a decent culture. At almost the same time, next slide, in 1966, Mao Zedong announced the Cultural Revolution in China. They took a slightly different approach, but used the Red Guards to, as a battering ram against science, against music, against scientists and musicians in China in an attempt to wipe out culture and science in China. Now, I wanted to have a, a, a short clip from this movie to give you a sense of what occurred 50 years ago in China.
classical music, they just uh, reaction to the, the crowd. The crowd. <coughs> Cultural revolution, in their terms, was an attempt to change the cultural format of the country into a closed, inward-looking society that rejected any influence, acceptance, recognition of any foreign influence. You know, for them to uh, reach such a level, it's already very difficult because they've gone through such a difficult period. The Cultural Revolution started during the spring of uh, 1966. All of a sudden, in May, this storm broke out. I taught people to make violins. Those are the instruments belonging to the imperialists, belonging to the foreign devils, belonging to the West Germans. <coughs> It was like a bad dream, like a nightmare. I was uh, confined to a small room. <coughs> that's not a room. That's a closet in the basement of the, uh, of, of the library, just under the stairs. It's a small closet. Without window, without light, without ventilation, and there is a septic tank in the under the floor, and a big pipe. The, the refuse comes from the toilet through that pipe into the uh, septic tank, and smells very bad. <laughs> I had to stay there for 14 months, and. For lack of, uh, because the lack of oxygen, lack <coughs> of air, my legs were s swollen. Uh, I think the chief reason they did that uh, to all the to all the all the professors and teachers is <coughs> just to get rid of us because they want to to get power to get control of the conservatory, uh, to get control of the music. But during a period, I was not allowed to come out. I had to stay in the dark room all the time. Somebody will send me something to eat. I was allowed to come out for a few minutes every day to get the water to go to the toilet. And once uh, my, my daughter came from uh, uh, Peking, she wants to see me. And the Red Guard told me, your daughter wants to see you, but uh, I allow, allow you only five minutes to talk with her. And with his presence. So it was in the evening. He led me to a corner of the wall, and I saw my daughter in the dark with a granddaughter of uh, seven years. Uh, when I saw my granddaughter, my granddaughter called me grandfather. I couldn't re restrain my tears. Because I was treated as a, as a criminal. Mm -hmm. we sometimes we were treated, treated as animals. Ten of our teachers died of, uh, by suicide because they couldn't stand the humiliation and torture, especially the torture of the mind and the humiliation. Of course, we were beaten, we were kicked and beaten in many ways. But uh, that's, uh, I think that's all right, <laughs> comparing with the 
the humiliation. We were treated as criminals because we taught them Western music. <laughs> so that's what China had to fight its way back from 50 years ago today. So if you think about it, in the United States you had a, a degeneration underway. In China it was, you know, uh, much more vicious in a certain way. The difference is that in 1976, Mao Zedong died in China. And a grouping took over led by Deng Xiaoping, who made the decision to reverse this policy and introduce once again, you know, uh, classical music and science. You know about the space program in China, I think, you know, and what they're doing. But also to introduce classical music. It's come to the point now where China produces something like 75% of the world's pianos. Mm. They not only produce mm. the pianos, they play the pianos. <laughs> there are various <laughs> estimates, but up to 75 million Chinese students <laughs> are studying piano. Maybe 25 million you know, uh, students in China are studying violin. And as all the Westerners, you know, I read a lot of articles about the uh, classical music in China. But all the Westerners, you know, are just so jealous. They said, we could never even begin to get anything like this in the United States or in Europe. Um, that is the situation now in China. Um, and one of, the most, one of the most thrilling moments that you can experience is this journey by Isaac Stern, who came for a month to China with his, as I said, his whole family uh, to help reintroduce uh, classical culture. And this was not something that the Chinese wanted simply for an elite. Mike, you can just show a couple of these pictures. Every class they did, you know, the simplest kind of uh, classes for him to demonstrate how to, uh, not that one so much as the one with the big audiences. Well, he, yeah, he worked with these very young children, but um, that's, a, that's one of the concerts. You probably couldn't fit another person into that hall. <laughs> That's one of the uh, master classes. And Mike, I asked Mike to find a few, and he found about 10. This was a mass movement of people from the very beginning um, in uh, China. They had to deal with some real difficulties when Isaac Stern was accompanied by a man named Philip, David Gollop, on the piano. And when they got to Shanghai, which had, and the man you heard being interviewed was the deputy director of the Shanghai Conservatory, um, which has been rebuilt. But at the time that uh, Isaac Stern and David Golub went there, they could not find one piano which was usable for a classical concert in the entire city of Shanghai. Now, I don't know what the population of Shanghai was then, but it's something like 20 million now. Wow. Uh, and it was only after threatening to demand that a piano being brought in from Beijing, that they found a <laughs> private piano that somebody had hidden that hadn't been destroyed. Wow. All 500 grand pianos at the Shanghai Conservatory had been destroyed. Oh Everything oh. had been destroyed. Right? Um, and, you know, um, <coughs> then a few weeks ago, David Stern, who was 16 when he accompanied his father almost 40 years ago, gave an interview, he said, um, he, and he came back in 1999 uh, and began conducting there. He said, now there are projects and investments in classical music going on in China today that are not happening anywhere in the world. And it's not just money. Yes, there is a wealth going toward classical music, but there has to be a decision to make that wealth go towards classical music. And if you look at what happened, um, classical music was reintroduced to the population, but it was also very highly valued by the leadership. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was the man who reversed the Cultural Revolution and reversed the decline of China, died in 1997. And the man who was president at the time, uh, Jean Zemin, said publicly that the way he was able to deal with the death of Deng Xiaoping was by listening to Mozart's Requiem. Um, <laughs> really? 
Now, at the same time, you know, you have various, I'm going to just shorten this because it's been such a long day, but you have various uh, uh, new concert halls being built all over China, and Mike has a couple of pictures of them somewhere in this you know, library. But yeah, this is in uh, Changjin, which is about the fourth largest city in China. They built a replica of the whole Lincoln Center really? in that you know, city just very recently. In Shanghai, they built a new concert hall. They're building a new opera hall. Every You can read articles about what are small cities for China, you know, maybe a million or two, which are, you know, where they hadn't heard classical music, where they now have concert, you know, brand new concert halls. They're building orchestras. The um, Juilliard is going to uh, set up a branch in Changjin. This, you know, classical music is just everywhere. At the same time, if you look in the West, most of the nation, the, the uh, cities and places that have had big classical music concerts and contests are shutting them down. Mm -hmm. Paris being one, where they had three or four different major classical contests which no longer exist. And the way David Stern put it is, we're finding ourselves in a funny position in terms of world society and civilization where we have to defend classical music as a necessary thing in Paris. And yet, you go to a small town in China, and they're building concert halls that are the equivalent to some of the greatest concert halls in the world. Now, what you have is a leadership which made a conscious decision to develop this capacity in their own population. What we saw with the drive to overturn the veto of JASTA was the beginnings of such a leadership inside the United States. Now, that is coming from the work that the Rouge Pack is doing, the work that the families were doing, and others. And once again, you had Mozart you know, at the center. And I would uh, venture to say that people, you know, some years from now, in a civilization in the United States where we value classical culture and are competing with the Chinese for how many you know, students we can have in piano and violin and how many orchestras and what kind of great culture we can have, may well look back on those living memorial concerts of Mozart's Requiem <coughs> in the New York City area in 2016 as the turning point. Mm -hmm. Now, I was going to show you uh, something, but I, I will just refer you to the internet to see it because we're running short on time. The, the Chinese in um, September of this year were the hosts for the Group of 20 meeting. And they did something which, to my knowledge, and the Group of 20 has been around for since the early 1990s. Uh, to my knowledge, this has never been done before. They opened the meeting with a concert of classical Chinese music, classical Russian music, and classical Western European music. And they, uh, Helga Ruf, uh, referenced it. They staged it in such a way that it was absolutely spectacular. And interestingly enough, in terms of our collaboration with the Chinese, the piece that they ended the program with, the, the large piece of the one I was was the Oja Joy, written by Friedrich Schiller. And to music by Beethoven. So if you go on the internet, go on YouTube, you can look up G20 opening gala or opening concert, and you can watch that. It's about half an hour, and I would recommend it to people. So that's what I wanted to
Well, we should talk after. Joe has to leave. Otherwise, Joe has to leave one of our singers to go to work. So that's why we're jumping right into doing a bit of singing, and then we can take questions after that. Is
next piece we're going to do is titled His Name So Sweet. <coughs>
alarm clock. You're supposed to wake up and go to work.
one song, and this is also a song that Helga LaRouche has deemed the uh, song of the, the Renaissance, the new paradigm. <laughs> so it's a spiritual call, the gospel train. <coughs>
that has been presented to you today, the power of freedom, the power of beauty, the expression of who we are as a creative species. This is what we have to you know, replace with the evil of geopolitics and war and the chaos that we see going on to the, throughout the world, the killing, and give people a sense that they have reason and they have purpose for life. And the reason and purpose for life is to make these, these great creative discoveries to actually bring mankind together as a as a one. So um, I know you all are looking forward to coming to chorus. Uh, <laughs> so I will tell you again, come on Tuesday nights uh, from here? six to eight p.m. There are some flyers out front. Um, the address is here: Lansdale Community College. Community Center. Community. <laughs> Community. Lansdale Community Center. And I look forward to seeing you all, and I appreciate everybody who stayed today. Um, take this. I will let you know that um, this was just the beginning. We hope to have many of such events. Um, Friedrich Schiller, the founder, or the person by which we named our Schiller Institute, his, birth, his birthday is November. Uh, on the 10th, and we're going to be having another cultural event on that weekend on the 12th. But we need all of your participation. I know some people also, we didn't get a chance to put you in the program, but hey, let's start working. I heard people who want to recite some Russian poetry and other poetry. There's other musicians in the room, so let's... I saw some people who knew the music really well.